Good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm Chris Jackson. I'm the head of environmental modeling here in BGS. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about generating and sharing a two-meter resolution land cover map of London. I'm actually um, st stepping in at the last minute for one of my team who apologizes that she couldn't be here today. She had to go to Scotland for an, a rescheduled project meeting. So yeah, this is work that Tiana Jovanovic has done. Um, Tiana is an urban hydrologist in, here in BGS Keyworth with a background in civil engineering. Um, she's interested in, in urban hydrology, complexity, and particularly green infrastructure, so sustainable drainage systems. Um, this was work that she's been doing on our um, five-year project that's been funded by UKRI NERC, which is nearing an end, um, called Community Water Management for a Livable London, which is all about uh, water, wa improving water management in, in, in London. Um, so, yeah, she's, she, and this work came out of necessity. We needed a high resolution land cover map for London to do other, other work related to sustainable drainage. Um, and so she began looking at the available data sets that, that we could potentially use and realized that there was nothing out there that was that helpful um, at the scale and resolution that she, that she needed. So, so, so this brings, yeah, for those in BGS, if you want to chat to, to, chat to Tiana, please, please, um, please do when she comes back, back on site. So yeah, this brings us to her first point, which is existing freely available land cover data sets are not of sufficient resolution for urban studies. Um, there are some good land cover data sets out there. Uh, this is one that's widely used um, and very good quality published by UKCEH. This is a, a national map at uh, 25 metre resolution. So you see the, the land cover classes in the top left and you see the, the satellite image for London in the top right. And in the middle you see the... the um, the categories within that land cover data set and some of the relevant ones we've we've added in their descriptive their descriptive titles and in particular what we're interested in in these two is, is covered by these two urban and suburban um, if you look at the documentation for the land cover this land cover data set urban includes dense urban such as town and city centers where there is typically little vegetation and suburban includes um, areas where the spectral signature is a mix of urban and vegetation signatures. So if we look a bit closer, you can see that some, some areas within, within, within the, the London area are captured by those, um, those non-urban classes. Um, but as you uh, look in detail, um, you see that a lot of those, those smaller areas which are not you know, kind of hard concrete are missed by these land cover maps. And, um, and then if you go down even further, you see that some of those areas are actually quite large. They're the area of a block of, of, um, of uh, a few blocks, and they're, they're completely missed by these land cover maps. So, so we needed something, something that allowed us to, to um, to work at much higher resolution. And so going back to the rationale, um, the rationale for creating this data set was all about blue-green infrastructure. Um, and blue-green infrastructure is designed to be fitted in gardens and patches along streets. Um, and for us to be able to model them, we need, we need detailed information at a much higher resolution. Um, so, there are more land cover data sets coming out with the from um, from from satellite products such as Sentinel One and Sentinel Two, and these are down to resolution of 10 meters. But unfortunately, they still use the same naming conventions and categorization of of, of cities. So they still use urban and suburban. Um, but you know, as you can obviously see from these from these images, that. Um, urban areas are really highly heterogeneous landscape with varying degree of, of natural areas within them and that's that's what we're we're interested in so we we started so Tiana started looking around 
when she was thinking about this, about what data sets we have within BGS, and more importantly, what data sets we could use to create a high resolution land cover data set. Um, yeah, um, one that was um, clearly very useful to us and one which we, we used was OS Master Map Topography Layer, which I'm sure uh, most of you know about. Um, but for those of you that, um, that, that may not, it's a very detailed topography layer, but it doesn't have details on vegetative land cover. Um, it's proprietary, but fortunately, at the time that we were thinking about this, um, it was made available through the public sector geospatial agreement, um, which, which meant we could really, really make, make use of it. So that serves as the basis for the kind of impermeable surfaces within, within, um, within the area that we're looking at. But um, uh, then we have to consider how we're going to ha had to consider how we're going about how we go about um, mapping where the vegetated areas were within within London. And for that. Um, we needed a, a, a near-infrared near sensor image to be able to de detect the vegetation and, and, and to enable us to calculate the normalised difference vegetation index, which you may have heard about, the NDVI. So apparently, this is what Tiana tells me, after talking to colleagues and then after talking to more colleagues, we found the right person in BGS who could point, us, point her to, to uh, the data set, which was this PGA... PGA dataset, um, which has licensing conditions on it, which allow us to, to use it and release the resulting dataset openly at the end of at the end of this process. So we can distinguish where the vegetation is, but then we've got to distinguish between the different types of, of vegetation. And so for that, we needed some elevation data. Um, specifically, we needed a digital surface model and a digital terrain model from which to, to estimate the heights of vegetation. And again, there are a number of uh, DSM and DTM products that we could use within, within BGS, but they have various restrictions on them. Um, but um, yeah, fortunately, the Environment Agency released their LiDAR data, which is uh, High resolution, one meter to five meter, and um, allows us eventually to publish data as as, as openly available. So um, that's that's the data sets we use. Those are the data sets we use to produce this product. And then Tiana wanted me to tell you a little bit about how she processed processed all of that data. Um, so, in her view. Um, uh, Many known GI, G, um, graphical user interface software, uh, in her opinion, this may be true, I, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, um, struggle when you're processing lots of large, large data. So everything that she did um, was, in, was in Python using standard Python geospatial libraries such as GeoPandas and Rasterio. Um, so yeah, uh, some of the operations in the workflow include reshaping raster files, categorizing and rasterizing vector data sets and extracting data directly from ESRI databases. So yeah, um, uh, Tiana is very much a Python, Python evangelist. Um, and uh, how did she go about processing the data within Python? Well, all the processing was done on, on, on one kilometer tiles. Um, the OS master map topography layer was the only vector data set, but we tiled, she tiled that in the same way onto these one kilometer grids. Uh, yeah, we processed the land cover map for the whole of the greater London area, but also for the wastewater resource zones, which slightly extend outside of the greater London area, because uh, we're a bunch of hydrologists and we're interested in, in flows around catchments. So we included the water resource zone. So in total, there were 2,349 one kilometer tiles. And then on her laptop, I'm told it took, us, took her two hours to process all of these data to produce, to produce the, the final land cover data set. One of the things that she struggled with apparently was um, 
yeah, we didn't, we didn't, she didn't arrive directly to the data sets she wanted to use to produce our final product. She looked at a variety of products, a variety of DTMs and DSMs. Um, yeah, and on our systems, they were all stored in a variety of ways on different grids. So some of them were stored on 100 kilometers square, some 50, some 10 kilometers, and some were contiguous for the whole data. So that made life a little bit more difficult, apparently. Um, and it would have been completed a lot quicker if all of these were stored in a standard way. But I guess that's related to the resolution of the data and how much data you can fit in a file, probably. Um, yeah, all of this work was done in Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and apparently one neat thing about Jupyter Notebooks it, is, it, is that it can be used as a digital lab notebook. Um, this is what Tiana tells me. Um, so apparently a lab notebook is a notebook where one can record every step taken to process the, the information and the samples. Um, Markdown can be used within Jupyter Notebook cells to style text and uh, according to Tiana it's very easy to create tiles, he titles, headings and text for emphasis. So one for example can make a note of the problem that the notebook is trying to explore and once a solution is found it can be added, added to the text. So a very, very um, flexible and way of, of, of developing, developing code to process, to process things. So, um, just some, some notes on, on publishing and some caveats about the data. Yeah, it was, wasn't a, a straightforward process. There were lots of conversations between many legal teams and data providers to see whether they would allow us to publish the resulting data set um, openly at the end. Um, some said no. Um, uh, it was, we we're really grateful for the Environment Agency for releasing the LiDAR data. That without that, we, without this, really, it would have been wouldn't have been possible to do it at the resolution that we were trying to get to, which was about one one meter over the whole of Greater London. And then we we're really grateful to the Ordnance Survey. There's a spelling mistake there, I I, I, I notice. Um, and they were very open to dialogue, and um, and eventually we yeah, through talking through the issues, we 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 uh, were allowed we will be allowed to. Uh, to publish it under open government license following a bit of a bit of tweaking to the to the classes yeah we were restricted with some of the um, satellite imagery that we could use so it is based on a data set for the period 2008 to 2010 so the satellite imagery is not 100 percent up to date but that's that's um, one of the limitations of the data set so yeah this is uh, just an image couple of last couple of slides this is an image of the final product um, you can see uh, our two kilometer, two kilometer uh, extract, uh, sorry, a two meter resolution extract of our, of our land cover data set for that satellite image um, in the middle, comparing it to the UK CEH 25 meter land cover map in the, in the, in the bottom. Um, yeah, there is, a, there is a, um, one thing that we still have to do, we have to combine some of those classes, some of the some of the road and roadside classes have to be combined for us to be allowed by the Ordnance Survey to, to release the data. Um, so, so that's it. Um, here is the final, final image, another image of, uh, of, the, of the raster data set on the right hand side and the, and the, uh, the, um, the uh, satellite image of the same area on the left. Um, you can see on the right hand side the you know, 25 meters in the box is 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 may seem small, but it's it's not not um, of high enough resolution for us to do what we need to do. So the data will be published in the next couple of months. There'll be some documentation associated with it, and then there will be a paper in Geoscientific uh, or Scientific Data coming out in the next couple of months. Um, so yeah, if you want to use it, uh, hopefully it'll be it'll be there in the not too distant future. Thanks very much.